computer programmed reality. precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words, I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. And with the abrupt ending, we are back. I am back. It's Robert Phoenix broadcasting to you live from Flyover. Let me uh, let me start the video portion of this. So this is Robert Phoenix back with you once again on Friday, the Friday Farcast, broadcasting to you live from Flyover, Fredericksburg, Texas, where the hummingbirds are happy. And they're the happiest right outside of my door because I give them the best sugar water in town. That's what I'm talking about. What's going on out there? How is everybody? Are we all getting through this crazy time together? Um, well, we had the eclipse last night, although we didn't see it. Another part of the world, partial eclipse. I've actually liked this eclipse. Two interpenetrating grand trines forming a star of David in the sky. Somebody's trying to call me during my show. That's a no no. That is a no, 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 no. If the phone was nearby, I'd probably answer it, but it's not. So I'm just going to continue to get into the flow here. It's been an interesting full moon. We're not done yet. Uh, I'm sorry. An interesting eclipse. We're not done yet. Today is Friday the 13th, and Friday the 13th is a reminder of the death of the uh, Knights Templar in the south of France. I believe the year was, what, 1347, if I'm not mistaken? October 13, 1347. I could be a little off on the year. But it's when the Knights Templar were taken out. It was a gangland style hit. The Pope, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, again, Pope Innocent, not so innocent that Mr. Pope, a gangland style hit because the Knights Templar were what? Competition. They were competition to the papacy and the Catholic Church. And the reason why is because they were extorting the Catholic Church. They had very interesting evidence, little bits and pieces of information that suggests that Mary Magdalene had a child. You know the story. And she brought that child to the south of France. And it was a daughter. And it was the daughter that she had between man that is most commonly known as Jesus 
But in these circles, you know, we call them Sananda, Yeshua, Emmanuel. And so the uh, Knights Templar were getting some action on the side from the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church said, we've had enough. Let's take him out. And that actually was the first of a number of raids and onslaughts into the south of France were eventually the Albigensians, who were essentially Cathars, were wiped out. As Gnosticism was a competing ideology and religion with Catholicism. Again, let's wipe out the competition. That's what happened. However, a few knight arants or knights arant escaped and they made their way up to Scotland where we have the beginnings of Freemasonry and the Freemasonic lodges and uh, the figurehead for the Knights Templar who becomes a very important part of Freemasonry um, is of course What's this? I'm having a I'm having a senior moment now. Uh, but, but, but uh, Jacques de Molay, thank you, thank you. Jacques de Molay becomes a very very important figure in Freemasonry. So we have the death of the Knights Templar and the birth of Freemasonry. Thank you, Catholic Church. This is how life works. You wipe one thing out, and something else comes in in its stead. Ecosystems are always under some form of invasive attack, and sometimes when that thing is removed, guess what happens? Something else comes in its place and can be even more pernicious than what came before it. How is everybody? How are you? Last week, we did the show with Steve and Chris, Chris Crimmy, and that was great. It was a great show. People loved it, and it was like my first show kind of getting back into the swing of things is an interview show. Today, there's not going to be an interview. Today, it's just going to be just me talking to you out there and addressing a couple of things that are going on out there in the big wide world. The kids from Thailand, they've been released. Another myth, right? A mithraic myth emerging from the caves beneath the surface of the earth. And there are 12, 12 of the kids, right? 12 is a big number. Represents the apostles, represents... All the astrological signs represents the months. 12 is a big deal. Of course, there's 12 of them. And each one of them has their own little separate hospital room, apparently. Um, and they are scanning them for infectious, contagious, weird diseases. Did anybody think that they would not get rescued? I never thought they wouldn't be rescued. Elon Musk brought his submarine, but apparently it, it uh, was not the right fit. It was too big. I bet he's getting a chuckle out of that. My submarine was too big for that cave. They couldn't use it. Maybe that was the whole point of it. Who knows? But he did, did have a good intention. He wanted to come in and rescue those kids. And he has the resources, and apparently the submarine, but it didn't work. So the kids are safe. We can move on to the next child drama before the true node moves into cancer. And then we're going to be dealing with women and mothers as a result of that. So we still have a few more months of child drama bringing it to our attention. I posted on Facebook this last week. I think I might have even been... Um, over the weekend, that there are kids in Yemen who have been blown up, dismembered, disfigured, pulled away from their parents because of an ongoing war. A war's been going on for since Obama was in office. Trump has escalated the war. He sold Saudi Arabia a bunch of weapons, and they're going in and they are strafing Yemen almost every single day. Uh, the kids there are basically experiencing hell on earth, and then nobody talks about them. Doesn't get reported on the news. CNN doesn't report it. Fox doesn't report it. For different reasons. 
right? CNN is invested in one version of the narrative about children. And that narrative has to do with immigration. It has to do with borders, no borders. And they're going to exploit that for as much as they can. Because they're, they're, there's an agenda there. And the agenda is let's get these people in the country and let's have them become let's have them become voters. Let's have them get on the democratic roll and have them become voters for not just this next election, but the election after that and the election after that. But trust me, this election is a big deal. Like the Democrats don't want to lose. And they're going to do everything in their power to get as many people on board with the Democratic Party as possible. So they can be registered voters or even not registered voters. I mean, it doesn't really matter now, does it? It really doesn't. You just show up and, you know, your name could be, uh, you know, Javier Garcia. and You could be voting under the name of Thomas McMichael. And, right? It's like, it doesn't matter anymore. Thank you, Mr. McMichael. It doesn't matter. But, hey, numbers count. Numbers do matter. Identity doesn't. And they don't want to lose. They want to, they want to get as many people in the Senate and the House as possible because they want to impeach Donald Trump like nobody's business. I mean, they want that man out. If you were not paying attention to the grilling of Peter Strzok, who we're going to talk about today, or I'm going to talk about today, uh, you're not paying attention. You're just not paying attention. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. We're going to have more of these moments. I mean, generally, when they have somebody who's being questioned on Capitol Hill, there's usually a sense of some decorum, some kind of fair play involved. Some, not always, but it's kind of there. The veneer of fair is there. Not yesterday, man. Gloves are off. The gloves are off. It is bare knuckle in the octagon. We're going to talk about Strock and the Strock effect and what it all means. That's happening. But getting back to Yemen, nobody cares. CNN won't broadcast it because those kids don't matter. They don't matter. Now, if somehow they were able to get to Central America and then come up from Central America to the United States, all of a sudden they would matter because they're part of a demographic. And that's a fact, Jack. Fox won't broadcast it because Fox doesn't want to draw attention to the fact that we're actually running a war there. I think we're in, what, in 11 wars right now, essentially, all very covert. And they don't want to make the president look bad. So they're not going to bring it up. So you have one network and where the children aren't important enough. They're not part of, a, of an agenda. You have another network that won't bring it up because if they do, it'll make the current administration look horrible. So it's just sitting out there. Nobody's talking about it. And if people were so concerned about children and they were so concerned about children being separated from their parents, they'd turn up the volume on what's happening in Yemen, possibly Syria, Maybe even Gaza and Palestine. All of a sudden, we're talking about children in a much broader sense. And that could be effective. But that's not what happens. Because children, just like anything else, gets politicized. They get politicized. And they become emotional currency. And they're just turned on and off like tap water. For whoever it is that wants to tap into it and get a full cup of whatever, a full cup of victim, right? A full cup of desperation. Just open it up. There it is. Boom. Other than that, forget it. These other kids don't count. They don't matter. It's the hypocrisy of the world that we live in. And it's galling. Absolutely galling. And the left should be embarrassed that they only care about children in a certain context. And the right should be embarrassed because they are enabling a war to take place. 
that is essentially supporting the military industrial complex and those billion dollar deals that secret agent 00666 and his father-in-law did in Saudi Arabia, but about six months after he got into office. Both sides are culpable here. They're culpable. The left can get on the war thing too, but the left never says anything about the war. You know, they never say anything about Yemen. They never say anything about Syria. The left used to be a real anti-war party. Go back to George McGovern, Hubert Humphrey. They were classic anti-war candidates during a time where we were fighting a very visceral, boots-on-the-ground kind of war. There's nobody in the left. There's nobody that's progressive. This Ocasio, who got elected in New York State, she got elected on a number of different platforms. She got elected on, hey, let's have jobs for everybody. And, you know, it's, it's just your typical, it's like Bernie Sanders on steroids is what she is. But was there any mention in there about war? No, none, none. Because here's where the hypocrisy on the left is. If you mention war, guess what you're going to do? You're going to alienate the military industrial complex. And these people who are being groomed, and trust me, they're being groomed, she just didn't fall out of a tree and say, I'm going to run. You know, I'm going to run for Congress. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. They're groomed. People are groomed. And they sit down and say, here's your platform. This is what you're going to stand for. And you do not go into these areas this is not part of your platform. And I guarantee you, war is part of the no-go zone. That's a no-go zone. They're doing maintenance here. This could be an awkward moment. I hope it's not. I'll have to send the guy away if it is. I can hear him out there. Just forewarned. He may, I may even bring him onto the show. See what happens. He could be an interesting guest. You never know. The common man. Far more interesting than we might give him or her credit for. But let's hope I can just do the show. That's not her talking point. Not her platform point. And by the way, if... Just like her, Bernie Sanders, if they roll this program out, if they roll the program out to the you know, squeaky delights of the left, which is essentially communism. It's communism. It's what it is. How are they going to pay for it? Well, they have to take things <laughs> like your property, your bank account, all your assets. That's how it works. That is how it works. Because they're not going to get it from the corporations. You think the corporations are going to hand over their, their assets and their money? Do you think they're going to become state-run? These are multinational corporations. They have offices in Geneva, New York, Buenos Aires, Tel Aviv, Beijing. Do you think they're just going to roll up and you know have the United States to say, okay, you know, you're no longer a multinational corporate entity? You belong to us now. You think that's going to happen? No. It'll never happen. I mean, it might happen. And if it does happen, it would be global. It would be worldwide. And that's a different story. That's a different paradigm, potentially. So, I mean, where do they get the money? Where do they get the money and the assets to run all these programs? Well, they take things. They'll take things. They'll take your bank account, take your assets, take your home. You don't own it anymore. That way it collateralizes all the programs that they want to run. Plain and simple. That's how it works. Speaking of money, I read this uh, post the other day about the debt. And the debt planetarily can never be paid off. I mean, this country owes an astronomical amount of money against the debt. And then you add in all the various countries of the world and their burden of debt can never be paid off, period, end of story. So why do we have the debt? 
and especially as it relates to third world countries. Um, I've said this and I've said this for a long time. Their debt should be zeroed out. At least remove the burden of the debt from them. Won't happen, but that would be one thing to do. And what, happen, what would happen here if we didn't pay our debt? What, happen if, what would happen if Trump said to the Federal Reserve, hey, we're done. Sorry, you know, we're not paying this. We're not paying this interest. What do they would happen? Do you think they would send troops to the United States to take over the United States? Maybe. Maybe that's the price to pay for freedom. At some point, we're going to have to address it. Or else it will address us and it will be a much more difficult issue to address at that point. And we may not be that far away, by the way. All right, we got some action in the old chat room. What do we got going on here? Found you. Finally thought to check Spreaker. Hello, Judy. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. It's a really, 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 really big show today. Today on my show, my guest will be Jasper. Jasper's a little put out because I'm standing up right now. And he doesn't have any place to kind of jump on and, you know, grab the screen. So he's just kind of sitting over there on the couch doing his Jasper thing, which is looking quite regal for a tabby, I have to say. Very regal. Um, I wanted to talk about what's going on with Gaia and David Wolcock. We touched on this a little bit on the Sunday night live stream. And David apparently is leaving Gaia. And there's some letter, I haven't seen the letter. The letter was leaked. It got onto I am free or you are free or we are free TV, whatever that YouTube channel is. And apparently now there's a GEM, which is the Gaia Employee Movement. Whatever that is. And I found out about this because I was watching Sarah, what's her name? Sarah Westfall, is that her name? Who does a lot of Q&As on YouTube. I actually think she's a pretty good interviewer when she lets people speak. That's one of the things that most interviewers have a problem with, is that they over-talk their guests. And I've actually done that before in some of my interviews. It's not uncommon for that to happen. I think hosts have a lot to say sometimes. But in spite of the fact that I think she talks over her guest a bit too much, I think she does a good job and has pretty good interviews. So she had on Laura Eisenhower and um, Patty Greer. And Patty Greer has had an axe to grind with Gaia for quite a long time. I remember the first time her name surfaced, she was at Contact in the Desert, and Gaia had a huge presence there. David was there. Corey was there. I think they were, you know, doing videotaping. It was a big deal for them. And uh, Patty Greer made a stink about her, her movies. And I was trying to understand, well, why is she so, you know, pissed off and ticked off about Gaia? Well, it's because I think she did a deal with Gaia, and Gaia you know, paid her money to broadcast her films on Gaia. She made a deal. She had a contract with Gaia. And, Gaia, and I guess her movies have to do with like ETs, UFOs, Disclosure, that world. And she is upset because she believes that Gaia is suppressing her material because it is too truthful or uh, it's too controversial, Wh whatever, whatever it is. I'm not going to speculate too much, but I'm assuming that that's where her mindset is. Okay. Well, she was on the show with Laura Eisenhower and Sarah Westfall. 
And I met Laura Eisenhower one time in San Francisco. She seems like a really nice person. I think she's a little skittish and, you know, a little, a little paranoid, but, you know, who isn't in this world to some extent? She's always talking about being under some kind of psychic attack or psychotronic attack. It happens all the time. And I, I, again, I'm not dissing Laura Eisenhower, but I wonder how well-known she would be if her last name wasn't Eisenhower. I just wonder. Maybe her work would rise above it and she would be who she is regardless of the name. I don't know. But um, it's a thought. And she seems like a nice person. I've never had a session with her or anything like that. I know she uses astrology and all kinds of other stuff, right? She was on the show. Patty Greer was on this show. And what I got was a lot of sour grapes. Now, does that mean that there isn't something happening at Gaia? I don't know. I'm not there. I don't have the inside baseball. When I talk with Regina, we don't really talk about Gaia. It's kind of gossip, if you ask me. You know, I keep hearing that Gaia has been taken over by Luciferians. What does that mean to be a Luciferian? You know, for years, Gaia has been promoting Tr Trudy Styler's yoga videos. If you, you ask any Christian what they think about yoga, I would say most of them would say that it's borderline uh, satanic. So would having yoga videos be satanic or luciferic? According to some group, it would be. What does it mean to be luciferic? I mean, are, are they getting out there and promoting Crowley? Are they getting out there and promoting, uh, you know, eating children and sacrificing children? That kind of luciferic? Is that, is that what's going on? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't been a part of Gaia for a long time. I don't even do interviews with Gaia anymore. When I do interviews, they're with Regina, and it's on her platform. So I don't know what's going on there. I do know that David resigned. He left, according to this letter. And apparently, there is a Gaia employee movement. Now, here's Patty Greer. She's on this channel. She's talking. She has this interview going on. And she's aggressively being involved in the chat, in the chat room. And there's this one guy who's just a guy. I could, he's just a guy. He's just somebody who's commenting. And his comments were not necessarily uh, pro Patty Greer. But he certainly did not seem like he was some kind of like hacker or some kind of agent or mole or troll. I mean, there's so much of that going on right now. You know, just because I started my video on Sunday nights where I'm in the shadows, this guy asked me in my, my comment section, are you part of the shadow government? Like, like I'm actually like revealing something, you know, <laughs> it's funny because it's like, oh, that'd be really clever if I was, wasn't it? Wouldn't it be? I'm not, a, I don't know, maybe in my alternate timeline or alternate life, I'm a member of the shadow government, but in this one, clearly not. I don't make enough to be part of the shadow government. So she went on to the to the comment section and called this guy like uh, I don't know a hacker troll. I mean, he's just a guy putting his opinion out there on a message, you know, on a comment section on YouTube, and it seemed like really unhinged, to be honest with you. So I got involved. Right? I mean, I got involved already. I, I did twenty four shows on Gaia, and I know a lot about their contracts. I know a lot about their metrics. And there, even internally, if you have a show there, you never really know what the stats are. You just don't. The only person that I think probably knows the stats is George, for whatever reason. People are trying to get a hold of me. What are they doing here, Charles? I can't talk to Charles right now. Um, so that's a mystery. Like how well you're actually doing a Gaia is a complete mystery. That much I know. I do know that when I was there, I was quite popular inside a Gaia. At least that's what they were telling me. That's what was being conveyed to me. Like my shows were not far behind Regina or David's. It was kind of 
right in the same zip code with the two of them. The challenge with me at Gaia was twofold. Number one, they did not know what to do with me from a marketing perspective. They didn't know how to market me externally. Well, who is he? Oh, he's an astrologer. Well, tell me something about him. What is he? Oh, I don't know. He's, he's a little dark at times, he's a little controversial. You know, I don't know. I don't know how they were language me. But clearly, I think there was an issue. And the other issue, and probably the primary issue, was the fact that I made a controversial video. And I talked about these various charts that I assigned to Barack Obama. And that was it. And that was my last show. So part of it was political, and part of it was probably that they didn't know what to do with me externally. I was grateful for the opportunity. To this day, people still watch the shows. Um, if you ask me, well, would you have rather not done Gaia and uh, not have had the experience of feeling bummed out or let go or deflated or defeated, which I, had, which I went through. I had those feelings for a few months, and I, I got over them. It took me about three to four months. Because you're, in, you're into something. It's like, wow, this is really great. You, know, it's like, you get called up to the big leagues. That was like my, my shot at the big leagues in my head at that time. And that was done. So imagine you're, you're playing for the New York Yankees or the um, New England Patriots or the Warriors, and you, and you get the call up. And it's great, and you and there's the commensurate you know salary that goes along with that, and you know perks, get to stay at a hotel, really nice stuff, right? And then it's gone. And it takes a while to kind of get over that, and I did. I got over it. It's like okay, well, I was this person before that happened. I'll be this person afterwards, and let's just see what happens. And I've actually been able to you know, support myself as an astrologer and make other connections with Randy and Emily, and I've still got the connection with Regina. So it's, it's all good, right? And you have to get over these things in life. Every now and then, you know, we take losses. Even the greatest teams take losses. Two years ago, the Golden State Warriors set the record for the most wins in a regular season, and they lost in the finals. They lost to the Cleveland Cavaliers albeit controversially, but they still lost nonetheless. And so we, say we have losses in life. And a lot of times how we deal with our losses really determines who we are and how we move on. And so I'll bring this back to Patty. Like when I was that guy, we had contracts and they're all the same. They're all the same. Nobody has a long contract at Gaia. When you have a contract, you have a contract to do X amount of shows. And then they figure out whether they want to continue to have you on that contract and continue to do shows. So they, so essentially your contract employee at will pretty much, right? Contract slash at will. And that goes for everybody. That includes Regina and that includes George. I know this for a fact. Everybody has the same contract. And it's a contract. It's what it is. Patty Greer signed a contract. She signed a contract for her movies. And now she's in a place where she's visibly upset because her movies are not being, I don't know, fill in the blank. On the homepage, front page news all the time. I haven't seen her movies. Apparently, Jay has gone on record that they're average. Jay actually knows a lot about movies. He studied cinema. He's made movies. Jay's controversial. Not everybody likes Jay. People don't trust Jay. I happen to like him, even though I've had a few things with Jay that, you know, I wish could have gone differently at a certain point in time but I still consider him a friend, bottom line. And his wife, Sharon, is lovely, great person. But she signed a contract. And when you sign a contract, you are giving something in return for something, theoretically, hopefully, not you're getting screwed. 
And we sign bad contracts sometimes. Sometimes we sign bad contracts with people in our lives. Even though we're not signing on the dotted line, if we align ourselves with a certain person and we agree to be together, that's a contract. And sometimes that contract isn't a great one for whatever reason, which is why I really, really um, advocate that people think very clearly about who they are going to become involved with and have a relationship with. Relationships can change your life for the better or worse. I know it's cliche, but it's true. Life, lives pivot on relationships. They pivot. They can pivot for the better or they can pivot for, for, for the worse. And it's up to the individual to understand that most men make terrible decisions about relationships. Why? Because we're not taught how to make decisions about relationships. Society informs us. Oh, look at that butt. Holy smokes, I want a relationship with her. No, you really want a relationship with her ass. That's what you want the relationship with. But that's how it's kind of like come down to now, right? Uh, but we anyway, getting back to the contract piece. She signed a contract. If she had a better lawyer, she could have had out clauses. She could have triggers. There are a lot of different things that she could have done in order to protect her intellectual property, which are her films. She claims she was suffering from mercury poisoning when she was signing the contract. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case. If it's the case, then don't sign the contract. Wait until the mercury has cleared your system. Right? That's what you do. You wait. And you get a better lawyer and say, you know what? If this hasn't accrued X amount of views or I haven't had X amount of marketing dollars uh, spent on my films and I will audit you every 365 days, uh, the rights revert back to me. Now, do you think Gaia would say yes to that? I don't think so. I don't think they're in the business of amending their, their contracts to that point. So now you're like, okay, well, what do I do? If they're not going to budge on the contract and they're willing to give me money, and who else is out there? Who else is out there willing to give me money to distribute my films? Not many other entities. So you say, okay, well, I'll take the five grand or the six grand or the 10 grand or whatever it is because it's on the table and you hold your nose and you go like this. You sign the contract. If they're not willing to amend it, if the deal points aren't better, and somebody like, again, let's say the filmmaker was um, Ken Burns. Let's say Ken Burns did a whole series on the new age, you know, starting from like Paracelsus and up through Bacon and into the you know, John, you know, Paracelsus, John D., Edward Kelly, Francis Bacon, uh, you know, 20th century, 19th century, the Theosophists, right? All the way up through kind of where we are now. And Ken Burns says to Gaia, I've got this amazing, you know, 20 part series on the new age. Do you want it? Gaia would say, yeah, yeah, we, we want it exclusively. We want it exclusively. You think Ken Burns has some negotiating leverage with that film? Of course he does. He's Ken Burns. He could take it to PBS if he wanted to. PBS would buy it. He's got leverage. Guy would move on deal points, but that's Ken Burns. If you're somebody who is a fledgling filmmaker or you're not really well known, you don't have a lot of leverage. It's the same thing with being an author. You write a book. You think you can get an advance these days for a book? Likely not. If you've got a couple of bestsellers under your belt, you can get an advance. Absolutely. This is the world we're living in. Because there's so many platforms now with media, 
there's a devaluation of media in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm thinking she probably is lucky she got money for her movies. But again, you've got to make a choice. After the fact, kicking and screaming, thinking that all of a sudden there's a conspiracy against you because of this company, uh, and then creating such a stir that you want to take the entire company down, is kind of endemic of what's happening with the country. It's a, it's a microcosm of what's happening with the country and what happened with the president. You don't like the president? Okay, well, what are you going to do now? Are you going to burn it down? Are you going to burn the country down? Is that what's going to happen? I mean, it is a microcosm of what's taking place in a larger sphere. And now she's there are these like like drops, like Gaia employee movement drops, like some kind of QAnon thing. I mean, the whole thing is utterly bizarre. Utterly bizarre. If you don't like Gaia, don't sign up. Don't support them. If you subscribe, unsubscribe. If that's what your feeling is, then get out. It's really that simple. You know, do I like what Netflix makes? No, I don't. What did I do? I canceled my Netflix subscription. It's that simple. And if you want something different, guess what? what? Create it. Create it. Maybe, I don't know, maybe if Patty Greer put three quarters of the energy and created a, a new guy at platform with other people, you know, it could be a different outcome. Most people want to kick and scream and say, this is not fair. This is not fair. This is not fair. I'll tell you what, life isn't fair. It's not fair. Nobody said it would be fair. Even in, you know, the, the, the saying, you know, all men are created equal. It doesn't mean that all men are equal at birth. They're not. They're created equal. Meaning that Every man and woman is created equally in the same way. Although now that might be a bit different, thanks to science. But that's what it means. It doesn't mean that they're born equal. Okay? That is a clear fact. We're not all born equal. Some people have a really tough road in this lifetime. The other day I was at um, Walmart. I shopped there. I've had to readjust my bias against Walmart, to be honest with you, because it's the only game in town here, right? Do I support Walmart and their brick and mortar, or do I order stuff from Amazon? I'll go to the brick and mortar. There are people that actually have jobs there. So I was, I was um, checking an order. I got to do TV. Mars retrograde crashed my old, I loved my old TV. An old friend. Uh, but it was, hey, you know, moon in Cancer opposing Pluto and Scorpio. I had to let go. I let go of my Baba. That was my Baba. My TV. I got a new TV. It will not be my Baba. This TV is disposable. I have, I have memories with that TV. That was a TV that my, my son watched a lot of programming on. Let it go. So I'm in Walmart, and I'm checking in this TV. I'm getting, it's a complicated process. And there's a guy there who's helping me. And please, this is not, I'm not mocking the individual, okay? I'm not. But he had hardly any arms. And his fingers and hands were like this, okay? And he was clear he was, you know, focused, he was helpful, and he had to have, you know, one of their little, it's like a cell phone kind of deal where they check stuff in. And he was like, you know, I wouldn't say he was struggling, but was was not as easy as somebody like me and you, right? Obviously, this guy's had a tougher road than people, other people. I mean, try imagine getting through life like this all the time and trying to feed yourself. I mean, come on, it's, it's not easy. And there he was, you know, he's doing his thing. 
And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that sometimes you get, you get hit in life. Sometimes you have losses in life. That's just the way it is. And what happens and what's happened over the last 35, 40 years is that people have been conned. They've been conned into thinking that there's no such thing as a loss. And to some degree, that might be true. But in order to get there, you have to go through a very rigorous process to understand what that loss means in your life and how it's going to impact you and who you're going to become as a result of that. Some people will fold up the tents and they can't handle it. Some people will bear down and double down and make sure they don't lose again. And they may not learn the lesson, but damn it, they're not going to lose again. And some people will learn from it and say, I'm not going to lose again, but I'm not going to miss this lesson at the same time. But we become so inured to losing. Everybody gets a trophy. Oh, great job. Here you go. Here you go. Oh, what a, what a beautiful piece of art. No, actually, your piece of art looks like shit. But we're going to tell you it looks good. Because we don't want to offend you. We want to make sure that you feel accepted. Right? People don't fight. Not in a literal sense. When I was a kid growing up, we had fights. And I'm not saying that fighting is a good thing. Right? I'm not saying that. But they don't fight. People don't fight. And there are winners and losers in fights. If you get into a fight when you're a kid, maybe sometimes you get a bit of a draw. Generally, there's a winner and a loser in a fight. But because of this whole no bullying thing and you know calling in the teacher, people don't don't know what it's like, right, to have their lip busted or their nose bloodied, and to be able to get up and move on from that. You know, we become so insulated and so inured to this idea and even and what does it all result in like when you lose when a person loses what do they feel they feel pain that's what happens they feel pain and we spend most of our lives running away from pain and it's really i think to our detriment now do you want to be a masochist and feel pain all the time maybe i don't know i don't but I also know that a certain amount of pain is actually very productive because guess what happens when you feel pain, you say, I don't want this to happen again. I want to do something different. Ah, that's called growth. That is called growth. And the whole, whole not losing is about avoiding pain. That's what it is. It's the avoidance of pain. Sometimes you make bad deals in life. Sometimes you sign a contract or you're with a person that's not great for you. And at some point you wake up and you say, I fucked up. And what do you do after that? Do you blame the people that gave you the money and gave you the contract and handed you the pen? Did they put a gun to your head to sign that contract? Did somebody put a gun to your head to be with a certain person? Say, so be with this person or else you're going to get your brains blown out? No, you made a choice. We make choices choices. Take responsibility for the choice. Right? Take responsibility for it. And sometimes it's hard and difficult. And when you come through it, you can say, you know what? I want to make damn sure that this doesn't happen again. How many more films do I have left of me? Well, maybe I've got three or four more films. Maybe I can, you know, use this time and this energy to create more movies. And then you do. Or maybe you say, hey, I, you know, I don't want this to ever happen again to another person. I want to start my own Gaia. Fine, go do it. See how easy that is. See how easy it is. Gaia is now competing with YouTube. All that con when Gaia started off, this explosion of channels on YouTube had not occurred. It's making Gaia obsolete. 
And the only reason guy has stayed in business for such a long time is they've had some deep pockets. They were making money on the yoga side. That business was sold, transferred that money into the media side of it. I don't know where they are with investors now. I just, I don't, I'm not in that loop. But I would assume that their numbers are going down for a number of reasons. Number one, the content. And number two, competition. And YouTube is their biggest competition. And it's about the decentralization of content and media. That's what we're doing right now. So sometimes we have losses in life. Suck it up. Suck it up. Feel the pain, right? Feel the pain. There's a scene in Platoon, which is one of my favorite movies. And um, Tom Berenger's character is uh, Barnes, who's one of the best characters in all of moviedom. Like Tom Berenger should have just stopped making movies after that one role. So iconic. And it's funny because when I was young, I was really into uh, the Willem Dafoe's character. And he was the, the sort of the counterpoint, right, to Barnes. Willem Dafoe was, you know, heart of gold. But as I've gotten older, I've understood Barnes more. It's fascinating. There's a guy that, that gets hurt and he's losing his shit. And Barnes screams at him and he says, you know, feel the pain. And then once the guy does, he calms down because he was fighting, he was fighting the pain. He felt the pain. And once he did that, the pain began to subside. And we're at a point where a lot of people are feeling pain. People feel that they're ripped off of the election. This is probably a good transition to Peter Strzok. I've watched that shit show yesterday. You've got people on the left who are openly waging war against Donald Trump. Look, I don't really have a problem with that per se. I don't. However, however, asterisk caveat. Because they're representing their people, right? Theoretically. I, they're an elected official. They're progressive. <coughs> Excuse me. Democrats. So they're supposed to represent their people. And if they think their people are pissed off and that they don't like Trump and what Trump stands for, then they have to represent them. And then they can become bulldogged assholes who are, you know, engaged in this widening and this separating and this splitting of the cultural and uh, political atom that, that we're witnessing right now. Theoretically, that's what they're doing, right? But here's the asterisk. I could give you any president over the last 30 years who has as bad or worse dirt than Donald Trump. And we don't have to go back that far. Barack Obama should have been under, like Peter Strzok, he, you get this guy, oh, he is so patriotic. So patriotic. And here's, this is the rub, right? Was the FBI and was somebody who was in the employ of the former administration who has an agenda were they actually running a covert spying program on the President of the United States and the Republican Party? Which is what was happening when Richard Nixon was President of the United States. And he was running a covert spying program with the plumbers and the Democratic Party. Well, Nixon got impeached because of that. Or was Strzok simply a patriot who knew things about Trump and was doing his very best to unearth them and save the American people. So where you're going to weigh in on that is where you're going to weigh in on your political bias. But I watched that guy yesterday. And um, 
I wanted to stick my hands through the screen and strangle him. And I didn't care if he was a Democrat or progressive or liberal or Republican. He was repugnant, absolutely repugnant. He was smarmy and smirky and grinning and... Ugh. And these are the people that are looking after our best interests with the Federal Bureau of Investigations, doing their best to keep us safe, whatever that is. And this guy is like emblematic of that. If that's the case, we're in trouble. Because this guy was creepy. And it was clear that he had an agenda. He's a Pisces, by the way, born March 7th, 1969. He's a rooster. He's a cocky. He's a cocky Pisces. He's a cocky fish. He's a rooster fish. <laughs> Is there such thing as a rooster fish? There should be. We should invent one. Science is amazing. They could invent a rooster fish if they wanted to. Uh, he was just, he was, and, and you had the, the, the left. Oh my God, thank you for your service. Thank you for taking on this daunting task and being a true patriot. It's like, give me a fucking break. The guy had an agenda. They wanted to take down Trump. They didn't want him to be president. And he was one of their, you know, cloak and dagger guys, along with his little mistress, Lisa Page, who does not have the cojones to come testify. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed to be an American. Was it demoralizing? No. Because I don't, I don't, my identity is not associated with that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't bond at that level. But as an American, that was embarrassing. It was, embar it was embarrassing that the left stood up for this guy and tried to fucking make him a hero and just look at the pictures of him. He, he, he must have at least five or six personalities buried in there. Apparently, he's Jesuit trained. His father was Jesuit trained. He was part of the Army Corps of Engineers. All this stuff, right? He had all the right credentials, all the right accreditation. Doesn't make him any less creepy. I'm sorry, it's not a good look. If you're the left, that is not a good look. That dude is unhinged. And always evasive, always evasive, and always trying to get in. Oh, and, oh I'd, like, I'd like to respond to that. Please, make it quick. Why does the guy just say, no, you can't respond to it? You had your time. Please, make it quick. <laughs> oh. it would be great is if they, had, they could have like one person kind of off the streets ask the questions you know on both sides and then they could have a celebrity like a celebrity inquisitor on both sides. Wouldn't it be great? That would be fun. That would be good viewing. If I were president, that's what I would do. On these Senate hearings, I'd say, okay, well, each side gets to have one person off the streets and one celebrity inquisitor. <laughs> that would be fun. That would be, that would make it, uh, take it to another level. But the whole thing with Trump is in some ways much very related to this thing with Gaia and Patty Greer's film. And it's like, you know, you make choices, you don't make choices, you're part of a system. And I'm not sitting here, you know, beating the drum for the system. I, there's a lot of things that need to change. Change doesn't come, you know, at a high level very quickly. It's glacial. It takes time. It takes generations. Although we're living in a time where change is happening pretty pretty rapidly, I do have to say. Um, yeah, change 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 would be great. 
but it, but it can't be change that's based on some kind of emotionality where people feel like, you know, they didn't get a fair shake, you know, or something happened and they suffered some kind of a, of a loss. There are people who suffer real losses. You know what they do? They overcome them. They overcome them. So if you happen to be somebody that's watching this, and let's say you're on the left and you're progressive and you don't like Trump and you see every day, what are you going to do with that energy? Maybe you should do something with it. Go invest it in something. Get over your loss. Overcome your loss. Become active. Become a part of your community. Volunteer. Make the world a better place. If you don't think that guy's making the world a better place, go make the world a better place yourself. So you can wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to make the world a better place today. So you can go to bed at night and you can feel okay with yourself. Like, you know what, I did something good today. Whatever that is for you. Whatever it is. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to judge it. Even if it's going to work for the Democratic Party, hell, I don't care. But just don't seethe and complain and point fingers and, you know, throw stones. Uh, you know, when you live in a glass house, right? Just don't. Get off your ass and make a difference. Because the two are, the two have a correlation. There's a correlation. What's also really interesting, I haven't really quite like fleshed this out yet, but when I watched Trump during the primaries, he was really, really good at picking people off. Trump was a freaking sniper during those primaries. And you just had to sit back and marvel at it, right? It was like who you know first the first person they went after was who Jeb Bush. He went after Jeb Bush because Jeb Bush was the biggest name in the room. He had the most power. He had the most political cachet. He had, he had a crime family behind him, and then some. And what did Trump do? He put his put him right in the crosshairs and started mocking him. And Jeb Bush did exactly what Trump thought he would do. Nothing. Nothing. Because Jeb Bush was essentially reacting within a set of parameters that he had set up his entire life. And when Trump pushed him out of his comfort zone, Jeb Bush had nowhere to go. And when he reacted inside his parameters, it wasn't enough. You know, he was in a street fight with Donald Trump, and Donald Trump knew that. And Jeb Bush was wearing, you know, 15-ounce gloves. Who's going to win that fight? I'll put my money on the street fighter. And even before Jeb Bush had been vanquished, he was already on to the next guy. He was on to Marco Rubio. And he was on him fast. And he dispatched Marco Rubio to the point where, you know, Marco Rubio started to have that, that glitch where he started to repeat things over and over again. Holy shit. Check him off, you know, cross him off the list. All right, who's next after Marco Rubio? Oh, what do we got? Ah, there's this guy, Ted Cruz. Now, he had a little help with Ted Cruz. I can guarantee you that. He had people doing deep research on Teddy Cruz and his daddy. And he was able to bring that up. And he dispatched Ted Cruz like that. Done, gone. And even before... And the, the brilliance of Trump is that before he would finish somebody off, he was already on to the next person. So before he completely finished off Ted Cruz, he was already on to Hillary Clinton. But when I watched this through the uh, primaries. I'm like, whoa, it's kind of impressive, to be honest with you. How could you not be impressed with something like that? And if, if you thought that that whole thing was thrown, you're completely mistaken. Because I think they wanted either Jeb Bush or Hillary Clinton as president. Now, at some point, I think deals were made and Trump was inserted. That's, that's my two cents. Here's what I think happened. Um, I think Seth Rich, this is just my theory, my opinion. Okay, the only reason, the only way I'm sort of putting this all together is because of the high strange of Seth Rich's parents and Seth Rich's relationship with Israel going on to kibbutz 
and I'm sure that Seth Rich probably had a relationship with Israel either as a Sinem or actually working for the Mossad. And I think Seth Rich was inserted into the DNC's campaign. Okay. He was inserted into it. And what I mean by that is like here, you go, you apply, you get in. And once you get in, here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to dump all of this stuff that you're going to have access to. And you're going to dump it on WikiLeaks, which is a limited hang, always has been. What have we seen lately from WikiLeaks? Not much. Wonder why? It's not useful to them anymore. It'll only WikiLeaks only gets turned on when it's useful. Okay? Period of the story. So he did that dump with WikiLeaks. And then theoretically, Seth Rich was killed. I'm not sure he's dead. I think he was extracted. I think he got moved out. He's been reassigned somewhere. Now, it was that intel that helped Donald Trump get elected. It was that intel. Kind of pushed him over the top, right? That and, um, interestingly enough, Comey, reopening the investigation of Hillary right around the same time. That's a real pivot moment there. Two things are happening. The WikiLeaks dumps and then the reopening the investigation. And if you're Hillary, you're probably, you know, scratching your crotch trying to figure out what the hell's going on here. Now, in that moment, and I do believe that that was uh, an intelligence-based moment with Seth Rich. And in that moment, there were were forces that were operating outside of the normal electoral process. And it's my belief that it was probably connected to Tal Piat, um, Project 8200, and being able to manipulate information, and it came out. And it was at that point that, that Trump had to be beholden to two entities, one, Sheldon Nadelson, who spent a lot of money on the Trump campaign. So that money went to go to a lot of different resources. And Sheldon Adelson is a huge advocate of having the embassy relocated to Jerusalem. And Trump had to fulfill that promise. And that promise has to deal with also the third temple, the building of the third temple. And Trump will be the guy who will either initiate it, which he already has, or even oversee it. We'll have to see what happens over the course of the next you know, two years. But that's what happened. And that's how I believe Donald Trump got over the top and got elected. That's, that's my two cents around the whole thing. Okay. So his run-up to the election was impressive, though, when he was just picking people off right and left. And I've seen the same thing happen with QAnon. I was thinking about this. It's a similar phenomenon because QAnon has gone after certain people inside the quote unquote truth movement. QAnon has gone after Alex Jones. QAnon has gone after Jerome Corsi. QAnon has gone after David Wilcock, if I'm not mistaken. And if QAnon hasn't, certainly, you know, the the Anons have, like go to Jordan Sather's uh, Twitter page. Uh, he's got a tweet. Is David Wilcock one big stinking pile of disinfo? Now Gaia is under attack and one has to wonder kind of what's going on, right? And it's very similar in some ways to what Trump was doing in the run-up to the election. It was like, let's pick off that one, let's pick off that one, let's pick off that one. So ultimately, there's only one man standing. And in this case, it would be kind of one like entity standing in terms of, you know, quote unquote truth and you know, where this is all headed with, with QAnon and the uh, the Anon army, the anonymous. Interesting stuff. I just I just had that correlation in my head. It's like, oh wow, it's the same strategy. It's the same strategy Trump employed during the primaries. Until finally, everybody in the truth movement is pretty much discredited. And who's left standing? QAnon and the Anons. It's just a thought. Just something to think about a little bit. 
Um, I'm not sure how much more I have to go over or want to say today. I think I've said probably a lot, and you, some of you may not agree with it. Uh, some of you might. At the very least, I'll get you to think. So let's see, where are we? Sunday night, I'll be back on the live stream. Always fun, me and the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds backed by a popular demand. We'll be back on the live stream, Sunday night live stream. Again, you can find me at robertphoenix.com if you're interested in astrology, which I think is a pretty amazing tool, to be honest with you. There's a couple of ways you can connect with me. Number one, I have a course. It's a 16-hour course in astrology. It will take you from A to Z, soup to nuts. And it's a really good course, um, even though I uh, was uh, very closely involved in the production of it. Um, and I, you know, consider it my content. Um, so I'm proud of it. And I also know there's a lot of other courses out there. And for the price, my course is something that is uh, really affordable. And you get to learn a lot about astrology, which is a great tool. It's a great, great tool. It's not an end-all, a be-all. It is a tool. It's like a hammer and a nail. It's a tool. Or a hammer and a saw. A tool. Okay. Um, you can also get readings from me. I do readings. I've been pretty busy lately, which is good. And I have a uh, kind of a reading special going on where um, if you are under the age of 18 and you would like a reading with me, uh, you get a um, $30 discount. Normally, my readings are $155 for a session which are pretty affordable for people out there. They'll charge you $700 a reading. I kid you not. I kid you not. And I put my $155 reading up against any $700 reading out there right now. So it's, it's an affordable deal. And I'm taking $30 off for uh, anybody before the age of 18. Let's just make 18 the cutoff. 20. We'll do 20. I think 20. Let's do 20. Anybody for the age of 20, you get $30 off the reading because I enjoy doing readings for, for the youths, the youths of today. I believe in the youths of today, even though they may not believe in themselves. All right, I'm out of here. Thanks for circling back around. You know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real, your heart to stay open to what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. You've been the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words, I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue 
that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.